It's um, good to see members, some visitors. You're very welcome. Um, we we have, I think, some new members in the room. Um, Easter Jim, guys, where are you? There you go, at the back there. Give them a warm welcome to the chamber, please. And document excellence. I saw you a second ago, but I think I just saw them all. We'll, we'll say hello to them later on. Um, okay, just before we start, a couple of chamber notes, if I may. Um, the first is really just to remind you what happened um, a few weeks ago. Um, we had the British Prime Minister, uh, Theresa May, visiting, and we had a business forum um, in Cape Town, uh, organised by our friends at the Department of International Trade, and that was a great success, as was the PM's visit. Um, the, the noteworthy point uh, for the chamber is that um, we managed to have a seat at a round table um, with the President and the Prime Minister, wherein we were able to present um, our own FDI documents, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, Mel Brooks, our chairman, was, was the person that did that for us. Mel couldn't make it this evening, otherwise he'd be telling you this himself. Um, but it's really good news uh, for the Chamber that we're getting that sort of access um, in these troubled times. I think it's very important and ultimately you know, we're representing your views and your voice. So I think that's actually good news. Um, with regards to the FDI document itself, <coughs> it's actually something that's been put together. It's a very high level document. And I did actually copy you all on that with the notes about the PM's visit. Uh, but if anyone missed it or, or in, indeed some, some newcomers haven't seen it yet, we're happy to share that with you whenever you wish. Um, but that document has been put together by ourselves, the UK Chamber, um, the Americans, AMCHAM, the Germans, the Dutch, and the Swiss. Um, and collectively, that group actually represents 75% of FDI into the country. So it's a quite an important voice. And we've got every reason to believe that we are being listened to. So that's good news for us um, and for the Chamber. And just to summarize, there are four key points of that document. Uh, and I'll say there are only four key points, but let me just remind myself what they are. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the first is, of course, the regulatory uncertainty that we have to live with, uh, the rule of law, um, investment protection and visas and permits. It's a very simple high level document but those are things that we're focusing on now as are those other four countries. Mm -hmm. So if we all say the same thing often enough, mm -hmm. hopefully we'll get some results. Okay, so that was the first chamber notice. Um, the second notice is we've got the investment uh, summit, sorry, the investment conference coming up next month. I've sent a note out to some of you. Uh, by definition, it will be some of the larger companies rather than the SMEs. So please do have a look at that and give us a response when, uh, or as soon as you can. That's the investment um, conference, small little survey. I think about four questions on that. Uh, if you could address that, thank you. Um, we say uh, hello to our new members. I've just seen Document Excellence has just walked in, so let's give them a round of applause as well. <laughs> very, very welcome to the chamber. Um, what else is on my little list here? You will see this evening that there are short survey um, slips on your seats. You, most of you know we do an annual survey, uh, but this is just to give us a bit of interim feedback. Uh, and frankly, it gives our guest speakers a bit of feedback as well, because often they come, they go, and they don't necessarily know um, what, what the, the membership have thought of that. So, so please take you know, literally probably a minute at the end of the evening to, to fill that in and I think Leslie will be collecting outside afterwards. So that is that. Just a, a quick one about communications in the coming weeks. This is our penultimate briefing. The last one of the year will be in October and the invitation for that will go out next week pretty much as per usual. However, to give a long run up to the annual dinner in the middle of November that invitation will also be going out at around about the beginning of October. So don't get confused. The one will be the October briefing, the one will be the November dinner, um, and then there will be another breakfast in late October as well. But anyway, just if you look at it, it'll all make sense. Uh, but just, just be warned before we have two months, two months vacation. Right, so thanks everybody for here. Is, um, is Jacques back? I didn't say a special good evening to our, our guest speaker, um, Jacques Ludic, who will be coming to shortly. Um, and of course we have our sponsors for this evening, as some of you will see, a bit of a first, uh, a joint sponsorship. So Peter from Lex and Diesel from, from Virgin Atlantic. Um, as usual, the sponsors will say a few words on behalf of their company. So I think I'm inviting Peter up first to say a few words on behalf of Lex. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Stade. I'm a director at the Corporate Department of Workswins, a law firm here in Santon. I also have the honor of chairing Lex Africa. And, to, and Lex Africa joined the chamber earlier this year, so we're really delighted to have the opportunity of introducing ourselves to you. This is a, basically a nutshell of who we are. We're an alliance of independent law firms in 24 African countries, sub-Saharan Africa. We're delighted, in fact, to have one of my colleagues here from the DRC, Alex Mbikayu, sitting over there. We, we are a cross-border team. We have over 600 lawyers. And we were formed in 1993, so we, you can't call us a teenager anymore. We're pushing 30. So we've, we've got a track record. We've been, we've been working in Africa, helping clients for, the, for almost 26 years now. We have, we have uh, effectively we're well ranked by chambers and partners. We were the first and largest and are the largest pan-African legal alliance. We focus on relationships, not just between members and our lawyers, but also with our clients. We've grown with our clients in the African businesses. But I think just briefly, why, do we, why did we exist? We realized we follow our clients. Lawyers are here to help. People always laugh when I say that. But we are, we're here to help. And I mean, doing business in Africa, there are opportunities and there are risks. And the key thing, and we, I always say, is prevention is better than cure. So get, do proper due diligence, get strong, reputable local advice. That, that, that's the basis uh, and the re rationale for forming Lex Africa. We basically cover all key countries in sub Saharan Africa. And I think what we've been focusing on in the last few years is developing specialist expertise. The world is becoming far more specialist. Specialist labor lawyers, specialist tax lawyers, antitrust competition, regulatory, M&A corporate. The general practitioners are really on the way out, especially for corporate <coughs> clients because we focus on corporate clients. So we've got cross-border practice groups in mining, uh, corporate M&A, dispute resolution, insolvency business restructuring, competition. I think I've forgotten one. <laughs> We effectively, although we're independent law firms, we work together as a cross-border team. Some of us have known each other for over 30 years. You know, it's, it's, we, we, we're not just, I always say, we're not just an internet dating site. We actually know each other. <laughs> we've, we've eaten together. We've had wine together. So, and I, mean, I, I always say knowledge of the law is not enough. You know? And I think what we really try to work for and what our focus is, is not just giving you a pure, dry, legal solution saying no. We try to offer you a solution. Don't do it that way. Do it this way. So understanding, as you all know, those of you who have African businesses, you've got to understand the local customs, languages, practices, cultures. There's such diversity and variety in Africa. You, you can't just say, I'll get a legal opinion and that'll be the end of it. Your lawyer must be somebody who, who can advise you on the political, economic, and business environment as well. We don't charge fees, so that's, that's something that's, that's quite unique, I think. Well, our members obviously charge fees, but Lex Africa itself doesn't. And as I said, what we really try to do is a one-stop shop. We're here to help. We, we, just briefly, our members, you can see we cover most of the key jurisdictions in Africa. And I think one of the key, this is my personality coming through, I believe in substance over form. We've got guides. These are guides which are available outside if you're interested. These are substantive guides, doing business in Africa, guide to insolvency, business restructuring, mining laws, as well as the enforcement of foreign judgments and arbitral awards. We're developing a labor law guide, an antitrust competition guide. Again, these are substantive chapters per country from, from lawyers who are specialists in the field. Now, just enough of me. We've got a short video, I know I've got five minutes. We'll go into the video now, thank you.
US and Ethnics Africa. You are the first and largest African Union alliance, formed in 1993, with a long track record of assisting our clients in Africa. We have over 600 lawyers in over 20 member countries, and relationships in other countries where we do not have members. Each of our member firms are carefully selected to be a top local law firm with specialist knowledge, experience and expertise, not just of the law, but also the local business, political, cultural and economic environment. We pride ourselves on being a living network with professional and personal relationships in some cases going back over 20 years. We value substance over form, adding value and finding solutions for our clients and their businesses. Our goal is to be your single entry point into the African continent. Apologies for Richard, he really wanted to be here with you tonight, so um, we managed to get a second prize and get a quick video filmed by him. But um, a huge thanks to David Dawson um, and the team um, of the British Chamber. Uh, we have been members of the Chamber for quite a while now, and, and I, for those of you who are guests here tonight who are not yet members of the, the Chamber, um, certainly my team can strongly encourage you to sign up um, and use this as a networking platform. We feel um, that this is a relationship that um, certainly works in, in both directions. So between the Chamber, um, the UK Department of International Trade and the High Commission, um, we certainly feel like um, this is a, is, is a really good platform to network with, with colleagues um, from around the country and certainly from around the globe. So thanks to David and his team. Um, I'm not going to say a lot of words, Richard said it all, but um, I did want to say to Peter that we didn't swipe left um, on Tinder, we swiped right. Uh, we picked Worksman, so, so Worksman is actually our um, law firm in South Africa, they support us. Um, I don't know if you know that, but uh, I'm telling you that now. <laughs> but um, so, so again, this is really a, a privilege for us to be partnered with um, a company of this, um, of this caliber. It's a real privilege for us to be here tonight. Um, so I just want to put in numbers quickly what it means for us to add an additional uh, flight to the Johannesburg service. It's pretty significant for us and Richard's really right when he says he can't get on our planes because I can't get on our planes either. Um, so this route is actually one of the routes that have the highest load factors. That's number of people on seats on, on planes. That's how we measure one part of the success of a route. Uh, so much so that we felt the need to actually add additional capacity. And so from October 28th, uh, you will see 188,000 additional mm -hmm. seats on the route. Um, and that's a big commitment um, for, for, for any airline to put that, um, to put that investment into a country. Uh, we know that times feel sometimes a little stressed and um, you know, certainly this is a country where it's definitely a roller coaster. You feel like, I mean, I certainly know when we were together earlier this year at, um, at uh, uh, at Emma's house in, in, in Hyde Park, we were all feeling a real high. Silver Ramaphosa had just delivered his opening speech and we were all like super enthused about the future. 
now the rand's doing really badly and the petrol price is going up so we all feel like a little pressured but um, seriously for us um, I think that this definitely is a country of opportunity um, and certainly one that we feel very passionate about investing in um, and that's why um, this is the only route in the world outside of our North America traffic where we have um, this amount of seats on one flight so um, this is a really big decision and a big investment and something we feel very very proud of I'm going to embarrass my team really quickly um, I'm going to ask them to stand up because if you members of the chamber if you've not yet met them I'm going to ask for you to please introduce yourselves to them at some point tonight so if I can just ask the virgins to stand up <laughs> everybody up <laughs> Okay, so we have Eugene, Nicola, Mandy, Nikki, Darren, and Lee Zama at the back. So please find them um, and talk to us because we'd love for you to fly with us. Thanks very much um, to David and your team. Thanks, Diesel, and obviously all the very best of luck with the new with the new service. I'm sure you'll do fantastically. Um, okay, great. It's now time to um, introduce our guest speaker. You'll have seen uh, Dr. Jacques. Ludic's uh, bio on the invitation, so I won't go through that again. I don't know what Jacques is going to say this evening, um, but I know he's well qualified to talk about this particular subject. Um, but let me just mention something that I read um, literally within the last week or so, um, which was in one of the UK broadsheets. Um, there's a new uh, chief scientific officer in the UK, uh, Dr. Khalil, Khalili, sorry. Um, and he says, amongst other things, I've got a whole article, that artificial intelligence is a greater concern for the future of Britain than antibiotic resistance, climate change, or terrorism. The income, oh, sorry, the, 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 that's the other. And then goes on at some, at some length to talk about that. So um, I don't think we could be talking about a much more important or relevant subject. So over to Dr. Jacques. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, first of all, David, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. It's, uh, it's a privilege. Um, I, don't know, I, know, I don't know a lot of people here, actually, so this is awesome. Um, so, <clears throat> but anyway, so what I would like to do, yeah, obviously, thanks to the sponsors as well, Lynx Africa, Virgin Atlantic, it's awesome. Um, so, I'm, I'm going to, before I start, just want to get a sense of who is excited about AI. Okay. Okay, who is scared? Okay. <laughs> I wanted to go with neutral, but um, optimistic, excited, sustained. Okay. Okay, so no, that's good. Um, who knows about the fourth industrial revolution? Feels okay, cool. So I, I'm going to do a, a bit of an introduction to both AI, artificial intelligence, and, and also to the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, so what I do is, um, okay, sorry, the topic here is, is businesses Africa ready for AI and the fourth industrial revolution. So I'll allude to that as well, but I'm gonna start with just AI, industrial revolution, just providing the context around that. Um, and what we can do, we can keep it also interactive, David, I'm not sure if there's questions or should we have questions after? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm very flexible. If you really feel you want to ask something, that's good. Um, I do a hot stop, probably an hour's time, but um, I've got to fly back to Cape Town. So I'm in Cape Town. It's not going to be a Virgin, Virgin Atlantic, but it's Kalula. But <laughs> sorry, but this, this is not Virgin Atlantic. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so I'll just start with a, um, my personal massive transformative purpose in business and, and what I'm trying to do. And it's really around how can we shape a better future for, for us societies, for, for business in general, um, in the smart technology era. And I've, I refer to the fourth industrial revolution as the smart technology era, just to make it a bit more generic because it's not just industrial. It's really impacting all disciplines and, and I'll, I'll really talk about that as well. So I think we live in a, in a very interesting time. Um, lots of opportunities. I think it's also scary. We, we enter a dangerous world and that's why I think the word shape is, is very important. So we need visionary leadership. 
we need wisdom and we need execution um, to, to actually make the right choices and we definitely need to work together um, and maybe just a, f a comment I don't know who's read the book uh, Homo Sapiens somebody read that yeah okay um, I think the one thing that he talked about is some of the problems that we as Homo Sapiens experience is really um, on a global level that you can't really solve on a national level as well so therefore the need to actually have global col collaboration around these kind of things climate control technology disruption biotech there's, there's so many things um, so and I, and I think one one needs to look at it like that so I, I, I think he's onto something there anyway so I'm gonna I'm not gonna talk too much about myself I actually want to go straight to the fourth industrial revolution but I just want to mention um, I, I do have a, a strong background on artificial intelligence. I actually built a whole career on that. Uh, and maybe just a few names. I, I, um, I did a PhD in AI, but I founded a company called Ceasing Systems. And that was the first African company, uh, uh, AI company, that was sold to a multinational, uh, General Electric. So at least we've got a, a good story around that for what it's worth. Um, learned a lot in, in General Electric as well, but then started the Machine Intelligence Institute of Africa, which is a non-profit organization, and really aim, the aim of that is, is help to transform Africa through smart technologies, shaping a better future in the smart technology era. And we've got a community of more than 2,300 members, it's growing, there's a huge interest, obviously a lot of hype uh, around uh, the Machine Intelligence uh, around AI. And, and uh, so, but that's great, it's been strategic, um, it's offered me also a platform to, to be uh, at the United Nations to actually speak in Geneva, Switzerland um, on, on the AI for Good Global Summit. So I'm obviously interested in the sustainable development goals and, and how we can actually shape a better future and, and transform Africa as well. We don't want Africa to be left behind and I've got strong opinions and, and ideas around how we can actually uh, make a difference uh, on that front. But um, So that's that. Um, I, I then also I just skip a few. Uh, my current company is called Cortex Logic, which is the next generation AI engine for business. Um, so we live in the era, the smart technology era, where you see disruptive companies, uh, platform business, the Ubers, the Airbnbs, the all these type of companies, Facebooks, the Googles, they're all platform businesses. Um, um, that's disrupting uh, the markets, various markets. So on that, on the one hand, then we've got corporates that also want to survive and thrive in this era. So. Um, so what we do is to operationalize AI end-to-end -end and, and help the companies as well. Anyway, so that's in a nutshell. So the fourth industrial revolution, smart technology era. So and I, I start with, with these words. I, we stand on the brink of a, technology, a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, work, and relate to one another. And, and, and I believe that is in fact true. Um, and it's... And it's not just because of AI. AI is just one of the smart technologies. It's obviously an incredibly important one, a uh, critical one. So if you look at the definition of the fourth industrial revolution or the smart technology era, really it builds on the digital revolution and it's characterized by the fusion of these new technologies, these smart technologies. And really what's happening here, which is frightening, is blurring the lines between the physical, the digital, and the biological world and is actually impacting all disciplines, economies, and industries. Um, and, and even that final comment is scary, and even challenging ideas of what it means to be human. Now, I, I think we've got a choice here. So we can create a world that's more human-centric, um, where we can have AI doing a lot more repetitive things and routine things, and we can shift more to compassion and, and human-centric type of jobs, and we should value those jobs as well. Um, so. Anyway, so, so just that comment on that. So let's just move on. So the World Economic Forum, I've been quite inspired by some of the leadership there and also the African leadership there. Uh, Paul Kagame of Rwanda. Um, as a matter of fact, this is the guy just on the, on the corner here. Um, the he said the opportunity to raise the quality of life is the biggest business opportunity. On the left hand side, um, Robert Schiller from Yale University was saying we cannot wait until there are massive dislocations in our society to prepare for the fourth industrial revolution. And to the right, the chairman of Cisco uh, was saying if you don't innovate fast, disrupt your industry, disrupt yourself, you'll be left behind. So we live in the 21st century, if you look at the 21st century skills, um, it's not just the foundational literacies, it's actually dealing with complex environments and dealing with changing environments. 
And it's difficult for people just to just think, this is my career, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, this is what I'm doing. I think in, this, in the world that we live going forward, uh, one needs to probably disrupt your, yourself. Be a lifelong learner, and, and um, so big challenges, and we need, you need to get used to change. And you need to get comfortable with that. And that's kind of the lesson for the kids and the children uh, as well. And Professor Klaus Schwab, uh, the president of the World Economic Forum, said, in the new world, it's not the big fish which eats the small fish. It's the fast fish which eats the slow fish. And, and that, is, that is so true. So agile, being agile. Um, Kodak is not here with us anymore. You see all these kind of, dis uh, even Nokia, who well, is a smart technology company, what happened? So you can't rest in your laurels. Things change quickly. There might be a big disruptor. There could be six, six people in a garage doing something and come up with something incredible. Um, so we live in an interesting world. Um, okay, so if you look at the, the next industrial revolution, so it's just quickly going through this. Um, so in 1784, uh, we, we really talked about the first industrial revolution where water and steam was used to mechanize production. In 1817, we used electric power to create mass production, all to do with production. 1969, with electronics and IT and automated production, we start using um, electronics information technology to automate production. So now the automation comes into play. And now the cyber physical system, the fourth industrial revolution, as is what I've mentioned before, but I think the focus is more on smart automation. So it's bringing intelligence into the automation, and that implies a lot of things. Uh, assisted intelligence, autonomous intelligence, all sorts of different things, and I will talk about those things as well. So, so if you look at the fusion of these technologies, we talk about the technologies, and I'm, I'm actually on the next slide, I will talk about the speed of the technology change and what those um, technologies <coughs> are. But if you just look at this, and I think, who was surprised by the self-driving cars to see what's happening on that front? We, did, you, did you expect this? Okay. okay. Who knows about the game Go? Okay. One, two, it's not a lot of people. Now, you know chess, you know IBM, you know what happened there. It was basically brute force search. You can actually be the best players in the world with chess. Now, Go is a strategic game, thousands of years. It was played in China. And it's on a, on a slightly bigger board than chess. You've got black and white um, stones, and you move around, and you try to, to, to actually occupy territories and stuff. The number of moves that you can actually do on that chess, on that go board, is more than the atoms in the, in the universe. So, just, so you can't just do a brute force search. So what Google DeepMind did uh, a few years ago was to actually um, create, uh, um, use deep reinforcement learning, which is part of the neural network AI stack, and with Monte Carlo search, which is good old-fashioned um, AI, engineered a solution that got to superhuman performance and came up with strategies that, uh, that humans hasn't even thought of. So, and that was obviously in a very confined, very well-defined space, but it shows the potential. There's no consciousness or anything, it's just superhuman performance in terms of strategy and so forth. So it's, it basically <coughs> paved the way, it showed what is possible. And I think that woken up China and, the, the, and, and Korea and all those countries in the Asian bloc as well. And that's why you see governments going behind this. They realize this is something big. Um, and the opportunities are immense. Um, so, but anyway, so self-driving cars, drones, virtual assistants, software that translates and invests. We're also putting an AI hedge fund together. I think it's Africa's first AI hedge fund. So we, and, and, uh, and there's a lot of AI in there um, as well. If you think about software, software is also used to discover new drugs. Algorithms. We are, we've got also one of the companies in the Cortex group is, is Mosaic. It's, uh, it's looking at um, precision medicine for oncology and uh, we're very excited about that. A lot of AI in terms of that as well to help with drug discovery and all sorts of things. Um, but anyway, so but you also see this in a biotech side. I'm not going to go into that, but th that is a very interesting, um, <laughs> there's another big area, biotechnology. Um, so, if you look at the speed of technology change in the smart technology era, as humans, we see things on a linear scale. Time goes by linear. We feel things are linear. But then, that's the reason we, we are surprised by self-driving cars or the, the super, uh, superhuman performance that we suddenly get from <coughs> AI and all these breakthroughs and, uh, that's happening. Um, because they're actually on an exponential path. And it is not just AI, there's a, there's a range of technologies. And I'm listing here, maybe you can't see it properly, but biotech, neurotech, nanotech, 
new energy sustainability, ICT mobile technology, sensoring, 3D printing, AI, robotics, drones. And basically what we see is the fusion of these technologies to create all sorts of powerful toolboxes to create incredible solutions. Um, so that's why there's so much incredible opportunities and we will see exponential uh, breakthroughs um, and things happening. And I think the, the opportunities are unlimited. Um, basically what happened with, with smartphones, this is like a sensor. We, we are being instrumented as humans as well. So some people choose, I'm not going to use Facebook or some of these social media. But the, the fact of the matter is even if you use Google Maps and all of that, there's sensors on, and, and, and there's constantly AI machine learn, machines that can learn mm -hmm. from data, from user interaction. So we're generating incredible amounts of data at, at exponential rates. So it's actually the generation is going exponential and the challenge for business is the data utilization is linear compared to the exponential um, rate. And it's not just social media, IoT, Internet of Things. Um, and in the future, buildings, everything will be so instrumented with sensors all over the place and th they will become more intelligent because you can control them and there could be machines adapting and all that. So it's, that's the kind of world, this is the kind of runaway train that we as a society put ourselves on. So, well, there's maybe a few people that's driving, but we are the recipients of, of this. Um, but the bottom line is there's still unlimited opportunities to, to, to shape a bit of future, solve problems um, at scale. Okay, so uh, Andrew Ng mentioned AS new electricity and from Salesforce, Mark Benioff said the AI revolution is here. Um, I think there was also a saying, um, software is eating the world. And the re what, what we mean by software is eating the world, uh, it, it actually reminds me when I was at General Electric as well, where Jeff Immelt was saying, yesterday we were a hardware company, today we're a software company. Even though we, <laughs> even though they are just selling jet turbine, April, jet engines and turbines and MRI, MRI scanners and all sorts of different things. And the reason for that is all those, if you look at the jet engine, You've got about 2,000 sensors around a, a jet more uh, around the jet engine, and with that information, you can actually have a real-time model that models exactly the state, and can also do uh, so. It allows you to do predictive maintenance. You can predict potential failures, potential issues, and and so forth. And I think the big business case is for for these Siemens and, and, and all these type of companies, uh, equipment-based companies, is the fact that they can provide service level agreements with their equipment, so they actually sell that as well. It's becoming software defined, but I think it's also becoming artificial intelligence <coughs> software because it's becoming AI intelligent software, effectively. Anyway, so you see tremendous growth uh, in AI, talking about the billion market by 2025, um, between 40 and, 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 and 100 billion. Now, this, it, this graph was, was um, or diagram was done by Bloomberg Beta in, in San Francisco I think 2015 and it was just showing the AI or the machine intelligence landscape and, uh, and basically what you see there is just a range of companies there's obviously some tech giants in between but a number of companies that's coming in and disrupting areas of enterprise so that's why we say rethinking enterprise and then industries every industry you will see AI companies come to the fore um, rethinking human computer interface. Uh, we, I think the technology st stack, the last 10 year, decade, as, 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 as there's a number of breakthroughs, especially with deep learning and, and dealing with unstructured data, audio, video, text, th that type of thing. And that allows us to, it opens up so many opportunities. So if you think about artificial intelligence, one traditional type of application is when you, you, what you find in data science, where it's all about uncovering hidden insights. And, and you've got a, a much stronger toolbox now because it's not dealing with structured data, but it's also unstructured data. So you can work with text and all sorts of things. You can do sentiment analysis and you can calculate net promoter score, scores based on that. You can listen to recordings, you can automate those type of things. There's a lot of image recognition, you can look at facial expressions, all sorts of things. So uh, that opens the door for, for many, many things there. Um, so, but anyway, so insight is one, but the same technology is also being used on the human computer interface. So now we get intelligent virtual assistants. And and if you think about, what's your favorite one? I don't know, who, who likes Siri? Siri is still not very clever. Well, I, I, I still have, who's got Google Home at home? Alexa? Okay. So I, I don't know, did you, who saw the demo of Google Duplex? 
Google, Google's duplex demo. There's a few. I must say, intriguing, uh, that scared a few people. Because when they demoed that, was just, uh, I think it was earlier this year, was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Google demoed this, and, and, and they were actually doing live calls to um, restaurants and so forth. And it was actually AI talking, and they were doing the same the typical way humans talk. Maybe say it's touch or it's my stop words or uh, things like that as well. But it sounded very convincing. And the people on the other side was thinking this was absolutely human. So it was, uh, they were handling it exactly. And it, and it handled it, handled the whole situation, the whole order in a very graceful, effective manner. So, um, so that's where things are going. And Google is quite advanced in terms of, of, of that technologies. Anyway, so three, I think last year, this is what it looks like. So it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy. I'm going to just skip that one. So just let's talk about artificial intelligence um, a little bit. Now, we saw these kind of uh, definitions of AI. Um, uh, basically, uh, you, can, you can look at narrow intelligence, artificial general intelligence, and artificial super intelligence. Now, I'm, I'm still, still a bit skeptical about super intelligence. I know Elon Musk and his few guys um, and that's really talk about singularity and all of that, all, uh, all of those type of things, and we can really talk about that. But let's just go through the definition. So narrow intelligence is really AI that equals or exceeds human intelligence or an efficiency at a specific task, and that's what we generally see in most of the applications. And I think we, we should really focus on that. We can have hybrids of these narrow intelligence doing all sorts of different uh, different th things for us, but then you can potentially move to artificial general intelligence where you have a machine that with the ability to apply intelligence to any problem and then then it starts to proxy approximate humans effectively and and, and that becomes scary um, uh, but that's not impossible it might be that this consists of a bunch of narrow intelligence just working together as well um, and then finally you get super intelligence where the, where they're saying at the end and an intellect an intellect that is much smarter than the best human brains in practically every field, including scientific creativity, general wisdom, and social skills. We still have to see if that is possible at all, but okay. Um, so, uh, um, if you look at, okay, so just quickly, um, uh, artificial intelligence, machine intelligence, deep learning, I'll quickly just define um, the terms. So. With, with AIs, it's really the science engineering behind developing intelligent machines. We'll have software, we say machines, software machines, any of that. So, so that is AI. Uh, very simplistic, but, uh, but, but still accurate definition. Then a subset of that, and that was causing a lot of the breakthrough, breakthroughs, is, is machine learning. And, and the real breakthroughs was um, earlier, well, earlier this decade with, with deep learning. Maybe it maybe started 2008, 9, 10. Uh, as deep learning and, and machine learning is really systems that can learn from data whereas deep learning is also systems that learn from data but it's it's actually modeling high level abstractions if you think about the visual cortex the way we recognize faces you also see effectively uh, the first layers v1 you can look at v1 v2 etc and the first layer is really looking at segmentation and looking at lines and edges and all sorts of things. And then the next layer, as you go higher up, this is it's really putting it together and constructing objects, maybe a nose or a ear or and so forth. And then it can finally construct faces as well. So, and, and this is the way our brain works, at least from a visual cortex perspective. But you see the same kind of thing on an auditory uh, level um, and other things as well. So um, anyway, so deep learning mimics that. And and uh, and we we we're actually creating some incredible applications um, using that, and and really the deep learning recipe is we've got lots of data, we've got unbelievable computing uh, power, and even uh, Google is coming out with better GPUs, graphical processing units called TPUs, which is really focused on. It's almost like in the past with computers. You need to write a program and it needs to, um, and you execute this and it's got just very specific ways of executing this program. But if you now modify the hardware to suit the neural network, the way it trains some of the common operations, and you put it in hardware, you can do things quicker. And typically what happens with, with AI neural networks, a lot of the operations is happening on a layer. And so you can do all of those things in a layer, you can do in parallel. And, and that's why you can do things at 
fast speeds. And when we get to quantum computing and stuff, it's it's going to be even faster, significantly faster. So, um, so we and then algorithms. There, there are breakthroughs in algorithms as well. And but apart from that, we see it's almost like a chain reaction. We see now also a lot more money being put into this. Well, I, I did my PhD in the 90s. Um, uh, we, we, we used the AI stack in the 2000s quite effectively. I remember at all these companies, a 1%, 2%, 3% improvement in throughput yield translates to millions of dollars for the likes of Sassol or Anglo or all these kind of, kind of companies that we work with. Um, and so there's tremendous value, but I think we, we obviously live now in an age where there's no excuses. It's actually human standing in the way of, of, of all these opportunities now because we've got enough compute there's enough data, we've got algorithms, we've got funding, um, so we will see more breakthroughs as well. Okay, so I'll, I'm going to skip skip that, it's a bit more technical, uh, it's not necessary to sh go into the, this is actually the, what I uh, wanted to show. So basically the cool thing is, with typical AI, you had to do a lot of data preparation, massage the data and all sorts of things, but with deep learning, you actually skip, you actually work with the pixels, with the raw pixels, and you just take it through this, um, um, neural network and it actually starts taking edges, noses, eyes and faces eventually. Um, and this is the way it works. You obviously need the right algorithms and, and, and so forth to do that. Okay, so I'll skip that. So just some of the top data applications. This was recent um, and you'll see a number of them is actually in healthcare, um, which is interesting. Um, I, I think also if you look at AI, the investments in AI based companies, I see healthcare companies getting significant funding. So robot assisted surgery, 40 billion. Virtual nursing assistance, 20 billion. Administrative workflow assistant, okay, that's more generic, 18 billion. Fraud detection is a big one. And I think also with cyber security, well, cyber security is only 2 billion here, but I think cyber security is massively important. Um, <laughs> um, nobody wants to be hacked. Um, and, uh, but anyway, so, but there's a bunch of other uh, applications there as well. You, as a matter of fact, you will see preliminary diagnosis clinical trial, participant identifiers, etc. Okay, so now let's get to where these things are going. So um, currently you see AI that can learn from data, can do pattern recognition, and they can do perception. There's some abstraction, but it really needs a lot more improvements and breakthroughs on that level. And I think reasoning, for certain techniques you can start reasoning, but, but we still need to have a bit more breakthroughs so these neural networks can explain um, what, why decisions are being made, why the predictions, why the confidence in this prediction, etc. So I expect a few breakthroughs there. And Jan LeCun, the guy that was really behind convolutional neural nets, which is uh, doing image recognition and so forth, was saying similar, similar, the similar kind of thing to DARPA. This is DARPA. He was talking about intelligence and common sense. This is what we need if you look at what's the obstacle to progress in AI. We need perception, we need predictive models, we need memory, we need reasoning, we need planning uh, as well. So you can expect some breakthroughs and improvements and research in, in those areas over the next few years. And that will make a big difference. It will open up more doors and make it uh, more effective. Okay, so I, there's a recently a TED talk that I would recommend that you watch if you're interested in the future of AI. I just, I think it was last week, just a week before, I was at Leaderx and I was doing a talk on the future of AI. And the talk was, I think, about 40 minutes or something, and then we had another hour discussion afterwards. People were intrigued, and everyone wanted to talk about it. And I shared some of these slides as well. So this is Dr. Kaifu, Kaifu Lee. He, was, um, uh, he also did a PhD in AI and stuff, and he worked at Apple and Google. So he spent quite a bit of time in, in the US. He's back in China. I think he's originally from Taiwan. But I've got a, I share a similar kind of vision, because he, what he's trying to do is, is we need to shape this better future. And he's talking about new jobs, and he's trying to be realistic about what's happening with jobs as well. Um, so I recommend, you can just go to Dr. Kai Fu Lee, TED Talk, The Future of AI, and it's about 15 minutes, 15 minutes or so. Anyway, so, so what's in this talk? So um, he specifically, if you look at jobs, and remember, it's maybe not just jobs being disrupted. It's actually what, what's happening here is AI is focusing on tasks within jobs. So, but you can still classify jobs as repetitive, routine, optimizing, complex, and creative. And the jobs that's repetitive, you can expect to be disrupted by AI in the next five years. Routine jobs, 
And I will show you some of the examples of some of these jobs as well in the next 10 years and then jobs where you optimize in 15 years. And the job that should be safe, at least in this time frame, is, is complex, any complex and creative tasks. Okay, so that's on that axis. So, so if you look at it on this horizontal axis, and you look at some of the jobs, and you look at repetitive, you see telesales, dishwasher, customer support. Routines like truck driver, hematologist, security guards. If you look at optimizing, radiologist, reporters, research analysts. You go to complex, CO, m and expert, economist. Creative, col columnist, uh, columnist, scientist, artist. And it's ranging from optimizing this way to creativity and strategy on this side. Now, what we need to do is to actually shape a better future. And we need to create a human-centric access to this, where you can specify compassion not needed versus compassion needed. And, and this is the kind of future that we need to move towards. Now, if you look at those jobs, and you, and you just reorganize them on this uh, two-dimensional um, axis now, then you would see the customer support and tell us how you see where those jobs are on the left-hand uh, quadrant. If you go to the right-hand quadrant, you see some of these jobs there, and you can actually move some of these other jobs up because more compassion is needed, and you can argue that maybe artists should be up, um, and there's maybe lots of other examples of jobs where there's more compassion. Now, if we, I don't know if you can clearly see it's in red, but now we can look at other jobs which could be on the routine side, but where compassion is needed. A more human centric approach wedding planner, elderly caretaker, teacher, tour guides, beauty consultant, uh, remote tutors, and then all these other ones, social workers, etc. And then we can add. Um, Things like homeschool teacher, crisis hotline, well, you can add a, a bunch of other things. This is just give you an example. And you can take actually any job and say, how can I make it more human centric? Even a doctor, medical doctor, that need, that's going to change anyway. So because you need to look at, and even for lawyers, we talk about uh, law is going to be disrupted as well. So you, you, you will see that AI machines is reading documents and doing things at scale. So it's going to be a very helpful tool similar to to, to the medical profession as well. So, but anyway, so this is how we need to shape that better future. So now if we think about um, where AI is coming to play, so in this left quadrant, you would see AI really coming hard in there and taking over a, a bunch of those kind of jobs. Um, and when you move to this um, area to the right, um, you will see there's AI, but there's human plus AI. If you go to the top left, you will see there's some AI, but there's the warm embrace of humans, compassion, and all of that that's utilizing it. So it's working with machines and, and, and utilizing that in an optimal way. And I think that's a lot of jobs is going to be uh, really in, in that quadrant. And then, then we will get to, with its compassion and its creativity and strategy, I think you will see most definitely a lot of human activity. Um, and, and, and I think this is probably kind of future that we're working towards. And, and I think what we need to do is to make sure that we create those jobs going uh, in those, especially uh, uh, north of this horizontal axis. Okay, so I wanted to quickly share that. So and then I, I'm going to skip a few things here. Just quick, and, uh, yeah, I just want to quickly do this. So I think this is a, a slide from, I think it's from PwC, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, so if you look at the man-machine intelligence continuum, currently we see assistive intelligence, where you've got the nature of the task doesn't really change. And you're talking about machinery, processes and factories, boilers and those type of things. And you see the tasks are automated and humans don't learn, but machines learn. So that's assistive intelligence. But if you look at augmented intelligence, then the nature of the task actually change. And you see humans informing machines and machines is informing humans. An example is business strategy analysis using machine learning or AI. You see smart clinical decision support, those type of things as well. And then we will definitely move to a world where we will see more autonomous intelligence, like autonomous vehicles, smart investments, decisions being made, where the nature of the tasks change as well, and decisions are automated, and machines learn continuously. So we're definitely moving towards that. And if, even if you look at the market opportunity, you will see it's, it's, it's massive. Um, so this is what we will see over time. Um, and and, and uh, basically, if you look at that left quadrant, I think we will see a lot of autonomous intelligence in, in that particular area, but 
this is this is the world that we move towards. Okay, so I think more from a business side, and maybe I'm going to end off with a bit bit of business. Um, who's representing? Well, you're all business. Yeah. So 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 let's just quickly talk about this. For me, when we say, okay, how can we make it real? How do you where do you start with these type of things? Um, so I think the, the key thing here is to, to really start with the value drivers of a thriving business. And you need to say, okay, what can I do? How can these technologies help me to increase operational efficiency, effectiveness, revenue? How can it help me to create strategic value? Or if it's a customer facing business, how can it enhance customer experience? How can we get to more targeted sales and marketing? I think with all these kind of apps and things that we get, um, I think especially the youth, um, is getting used to real-time on-demand services, apps, the games are working smoothly, it's personalized, and gamified. Um, uh, sorry, you just... <laughs> um, the, the jobs, uh, you, so basically you see a range of things um, um, from, from, the, from that perspective. So I think this expectation that business uh, as well, that customers want to see real-time, on-demand, digital, personalized service. They will expect you to have context um, around the, the business. They're giving you data around them, so they expect um, a, a number of things there. So anyway, so and it's all possible, given the structured and unstructured data that's available. The thing, if I just go to strate uh, strategic value, I think we also live in the new age where data is new oil. If you, if you wanted to say, that, I think it's, it's actually true in the sense that you can create new business models, new revenue growth opportunities using data as well. So, so, and it also is important for smart R&D innovation collaboration. And I think one needs to think out of the box as well. As a company, you've got, this is the data that you've got, how can I enrich my data? With whom do I need to partner to actually create added value for my customers? Um, and those type of questions. So. But anyway, so, so those are, are things that's important. If you think about the insurance industry, I think we, we're really with AI looking at enhanced services and new value that can be created. Um, you can redefine the value proposition with more personalized customer experience. You can redefine the whole distribution with digital advice. You can enhance efficiencies with more automated augmented underwriting. And then if you, you can reduce the claims processing times also with robo claims and adjusters. Etc. And there's a bunch of AI technologies that support these technologies as well. So opportunities in abundance to, to create a different world and create new business models and, and unlock value. Okay, so in Cortex Logic, we, we basically look at solutions, and I'm not going to talk more, too much about that. I actually want to go to some slides that talks about South Africa as well. But in general, before I get to that, for a thriving business, the interesting thing is we, we are working with some corporates that are thinking about instrumenting their business even more across the whole value chain. And the more data you've got across the value, chain, the value chain, you can start building models of the business itself. They talk about digital twins. You can build a digital twin of a jet engine. You can build a digital twin of a process, a chemical process, a furnace. But you can also build the digital twin of a business if it's instrumented enough. You can even do the same of customers got a lot of information with customers, you can, you can build a model that approximates potential behavior um, that you see. Um, and if you can start doing that with a business across the value chain, and you've got models that represent reality, um, you can then do what if scenario analysis, you can do optimization, you can, you can almost treat it as a game, and you can start optimizing. It's almost like that game of Go, where you start applying AI on that scale. So you can apply AI on multiple scales. So there's many, many things that one can do in terms of that. Um, if you've got a, a, a customer facing business, then you want a growing and satisfied customer base, a bunch of applications. But I think you actually got a saying, uh, technology makes it possible, people make it happen. And your employees are pretty important. And one needs to think about upskilling, even in this new smart technology era, one needs to carefully think, how do you, how can you reuse how can you upskill people? How can you? How can people adapt to this new environment? And how can they become more productive? And if you, if one really carefully think about this, there's all sorts of solutions where you can have tools that's empowering people. Um, and then smart systems is is really around cybersecurity, fraud, um, a bunch of things around that as well. 
So I'll skip some of this. If you look at the whole analytic spectrum, just to give you a quick idea, so it typically it's it's you can look at analytics, you can say you get descriptive analytics and it's basically saying what happened. You can get diagnostics telling you why did it happen. Discovery is looking maybe at the clusters and patterns in the data and it's discovering hidden insights. And then you can move to predictive, which is obviously clearly incredibly valuable because it's actually see what could happen, maybe a day ahead, a week ahead. Um, and then I think very importantly, you want to make sure that you can integrate with the business. So you want to be prescriptive. You can say, how can I make it happen? How can I use my predictions? How can I use my hidden insights to actually create uh, uh, a more, uh, um, how can I use these kind of intelligence to create better solutions? And then cognitive is really learning at scale, reasoning with purpose, explaining, interaction, na interacting naturally. And so you will basically see uh, AI across the whole spectrum. Okay, so sorry, just this is on the MIA thing. So you can go to the MIA. By the way, if you go there, um, machinethelistafrica.org, you would find um, also um, on the events page a bunch of uh, presentations, resources, and all the events happening in this space. So we're trying to track a bunch of things there. So it's worthwhile going to machinethelistafrica.org. Um, so you can see all those events escalating as well. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Exponential, uh, even, uh, even there. <laughs> so, um, I mentioned the 21st century skills that's needed, so um, the complex challenges, critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, communication, collaboration, and then character qualities, <coughs> the changing environment, curiosity, initiative, persistence, adaptability, leadership, social, cultural awareness. Those type of skills are really critical. Um, and, and, and this is what our kids, this is, you gotta, they gotta focus on, on these type of things. So. Okay, so I've got a few things here. Yeah, this is all about the AI revolution and, and, and really the world, this is dangerous. It could either pull the bottom billion out of poverty and transform dysfunctional institutions, but that would require absolute collaboration from public and private sector, all, everyone, um, or entrenched injustice and increased inequality. We don't want that world. So we need to shape that better world and we need to manage it. So, so, so that's, that is the, uh, by the way, I'll make this presentation available. I'm not going through everything in detail because um, I also want to leave time for Q&A and questions and some interactions and stuff. Um, but what I want to do is I just want to quickly go to this Artificial Intelligence ESO Africa Ready. Uh, this was done by Accenture and they are kind of summarizing some of the AI technology, some of the things that I talked about. We were talking about Sensing Comprehension Act and they've given some <laughs> illustrative solutions. So this is kind of solutions that we are working on as well, virtual agents, identity analytics, uh, cognitive robotics, speech analytics, recommendation engines. You see how well Amazon is doing recommendation engines. Um, so so why do we need AI? So uh, basically, <laughs> this is interesting. So most consumers and enterprise clients will select products and services based on the company's AI instead of the company's traditional brand. How good are you in terms of providing what the customer needs? Is it personalized? So. Most interfaces will not have screens and will be integrated into daily tasks. Adaptive workforce, ecosystems, power plays, AI is the new UI. It becomes the new UI. And why do we need keyboards? Why do we need um, mouses and all those kind of things? In the future, we will just talk. And we just able to, and it will become, that's why it will become a more human-centric world in a sense as well. But we still need to make sure that we make wise choices in terms of how we live and how we, will, we've got definitely a problem. We're sitting in a transition where we've got kids and a lot of us spending a lot of time looking at cell phones and stuff. So um, I think it's all a transition. It will probably always be a transition. It's all how we manage um, that transition. Um, there was, a, uh, I think, a questionnaire out or a survey, 78% of South African executives say they need to boost their organization's competitive, competitiveness by you know, innovating through investments in AI technologies. So we say that, and what is holding South Africa back? Um, well, in a new era in which AI has the potential to overcome the physical limitations of capital and labor and open up new source of value and growth. And I think South Africa, I, I speak to a lot of Uber drivers as well and try to test what they think and so forth. And I think South Africa, they, there's also a laziness in general. So if we want to compete international, we need to be working a lot harder, I think, and learning more, and not rest no laurels. 
Um, otherwise, we will be left behind. So, um, and they talk about this chronic productivity deficit in South Africa. So we've got some interesting challenges. We do have, yeah, but anyway, so one can elaborate on that. Um, but I think the three main channels through which value will be generated, intelligent automation, augmenting existing labor and capital, and then innovation diffusion. So obviously innovation breeds innovation, innovation as well. And this is just showing economic growth forecasts without AI and with AI. So this significant impact uh, for South Africa in terms of our, uh, GDP. Um, okay, so I think uh, there's a few other things in terms of what we should be doing, creating a vibrant ecosystem. That's why I've been with Machine Intelligence Institute of Africa. I'm trying to work and collaborate with universities, startups, um, uh, companies, large companies, and so forth, working with government. I think um, I would love to see a, a government that works like Uber, seamless. Uh, just think about it, it's possible. And, uh, um, and, and I think with blockchain, we will get to more decentralized systems. Um, I would love a more direct democracy. Um, where you've got, you've got still, you still need visionary leadership. You still want people, but we can still have smart technology in place to help shape that better future. And we need to be creative and think about the kind of future that we want as well. And I think also um, practice responsible AI. So I, just recently I was in Pretoria participating in a, um, it's a United Nations conference actually in Pretoria. We talked about lethal autonomous weapons. That's a danger. And it's not like we talked about nuclear on the one day, and the other day it was lethal autonomous weapons or killer robots. That's a massive danger, and the problem is it could be very accessible to lots to terrorist organizations as well. So we're entering a dangerous world. I, I don't know who saw, there was a presentation, uh, there was, it was a Venezuelan president speaking, and it was a parade, and then it was a drone exploding in front of them, and everybody was just scattering and stuff. I don't know if you've seen that video. Than Google. That was obviously not a smart drone or anything. I think they quickly disabled it. But it just shows you well, this is the kind of, this is the it's dangerous future. You can have very small little drones that can do facial recognition, target people. Dangerous. So, shaping their future, one, one needs to be super careful. Um, but you also see that countries are taking this very seriously. They see incredible opportunities um, solving massive problems. We can solve climate, well, we, we can. Well, we have to see, but there's major problems that we can solve um, with with these type of, type of technologies and stuff. And we need to look at a comprehensive long-term vision, the role of AI in the country's economic development. This is what China's doing, this is what France is doing, and all these other countries. And even on, I think I've got a LinkedIn post, and by the way, you're welcome to connect on LinkedIn, and you can read some of my LinkedIn posts where I also um, write about some of these things as well. A very interesting world. And maybe the final thing that I want to say, I think for business, are we ready? There are AI companies um, that's, and that can actually help you. And I think if we, this is a very interesting, I think this is from, I'm not sure, I think, yeah, this is Accenture still. Um, on the X, on the Y axis, they talk about um, innovation. On the X axis, they talk about collaboration. And they've actually, again, did a survey. And specifically, most companies were in the observer category. Not really innovating, not really collaborating. Some companies innovating, some companies collaborating. And then you've got some companies that's doing collaborative invent, uh, uh, invent well, they talk about collaborative inventor, but collaborative innovation. And, and this is the kind of companies that kind of partner. They realize we live in the API economy, it's plug and play. You need to collaborate to make things work if you want to move faster, if you want to be agile. And, and this is what I would recommend, if, if um, really embrace companies that can potentially help um, you move quicker and faster and, um, and help you thrive in the smart technology era. And I'm going to end with that. Thank you. So, any questions? I think I've, let me just see, it's, yeah, actually, time. I could have, there's a few other slides, but uh, yes, question there. Cool. Hi, um, to me from HSF. Um, so I've read about two interesting stories. One is about two AI programs that uh, started speaking to each other in a language that the inventors couldn't understand. And they had to, they had to shut them down because they didn't, they didn't know what was going on. And the second was about an AI program that was trying to break out of the firewall. 
Um, what do you think about, there, there are also predictions that at some point AI will overtake human intelligence and this will happen in our generation. What do you think about those risks and, and what are we doing to, to mitigate them? Okay, first of all, the first one is fake news. Um, the, well, well that, it was kind of, that's, it's, it's um, if you think about even the current neural, um, uh, the current, if you look at what Google is doing with translations as well, um, it's in a similar way, um, as I've mentioned, if you look at that vision, vision example, where I showed, did segmentation, it created then little group things together, it create abstractions of that. You can do the same with languages and you can create representations of languages. Um, and, and that's what they were talking about, kind of working on this kind of level there as well. But um, it's almost like in a thought or a kind of level. But really that didn't pose anything. It's not like there's consciousness or anything. That's just abstract representation of the underlying concepts. And, and it's just a way to translate. So it, I think we've just... <sighs> It is just like we've humanized that. We've, we, I, I, think, I think it's completely out of context and it's not a danger at all. It's, 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 that's not a problem. It's maybe your other questions um, in terms of where this is going. So, um, so I, I, I think if you think about the human brain, well, there's various opinions around this. Clearly, if we get to a world where you can simulate, where you get the complexity of the human brain, 10 to the power of 11 neurons, 10 to the power of 4, um, synapses, interconnections as well, you might get emergent properties like consciousness and all sorts of different things. So it, you, you might get to a very interesting world. That's why we need to shape it. We can still have narrow intelligences that's really focused on solving very specific tasks. We don't need to create a, 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 a world or machines that, that emulate exactly what we do as humans. The danger is, however, the danger is there. So. So I don't think super intelligence is out of the question. I think it's, it is a real risk. I still think there's a lot of breakthroughs still necessary. We haven't figured out the brain by a long shot. Um, if we understand the brain, and we will, I think we will one day. Um, so